four great thinkers have profoundly influenced the nature of our age, and whose stories have, I think, an important message for us today. The mathematics professor, a man called Georg Kendall, who started a revolution he never really meant to start, but which eventually threatened to shape the whole of mathematics and science on its foundations. And he started this revolution by asking himself a simple question, how big is infinity? We put back the system that, that everything has to adhere to if there is no God. It seemed Cantor had opened maths to the very thing it was supposed to save us from, irresolvable uncertainty. The only way to convince his critics was to make his theory complete. Could he show there was a logic to his existence, some system that bound them all together? Now remember, Cantor's a religious man, so for him, that symbol isn't just a scientific mystery, it's religious mystery as well. Here's the maths that God uses to keep creation in motion, and at its heart lies the deeper mystery of infinity. The first modern thinker to confront the infinite was Galileo, and he tried to do it using the circle. This is how he did it. And now, with an infinitely sharp pencil, draw from the center infinitely sharp lines, one for each of the lines on the inner circle. Right, there's an infinite number of them, should be enough for the inner circle. But now extend those lines out to meet the outer circle. And those lines are diverging, which means when you get to the outer circle, if you look really carefully, there will be gaps. There won't be enough. The gallop is that that makes no sense. If there's an infinite number, it should be enough. At which point he said, we just can't understand the infinite. Maybe God can, but with our finite minds we can't. So let's use the concept if we must, but let's not try and understand infinity. And that's exactly how they left it, until Gail Cantor came along. Cantor had undermined the ideal of a timeless and perfect logic in maths. Altman's formula and his destiny was to undermine the ideal of a timeless order in physics. Together, their ideas were part of a general undermining of certainty in the kind of physics one based on probabilities, not certainties. Boltzmann's work on entropy showed why no system can be perfect, why there must always be some disorder. It also revolutionized the idea of time in physics. Boltzmann's genius was that he could accept probability. This meant he could begin to understand complex phenomena, like fire and water and life, things which traditional physics, the physics of mechanics, never could. His name was Kurt Gödel. He had just proved that all systems of mathematical logic were limited. That there would always be some things which, while true, would never be able to be proved to be true. Gödel had joined Hilbert in trying to solve the paradoxes uncovered by Cantor. Instead, he had just proved that would never happen. His work, springing directly from Cantor's work on infinity, proved the paradoxes were unsolvable and there would be more of them. Almost as soon as Gödel has finished the incompleteness theorem, he decides to work on the great unsolved problem of modern mathematics, Cantor's continuum hypothesis. He has a massive nervous breakdown and ends up in a sanatorium, just like Cantor. And so Gödel, like Cantor before him, had finally found a problem he desperately wanted to solve, but could not. He was now called a logical paradox from which his mind could not escape. And at the same time, he slowly starved himself to death. So the man, who made Gödel's already devastating incompleteness theorem even worse. Turing was a much more practical man than Gödel. I think it's really a 15, but I can't find it. And simply wanted to make Gödel's theorem clearer and simpler. Because for many, Gödel's proof had simply been too abstract. At least with Gödel, there was the hope that you could distinguish between the provable and the unprovable and simply leave the unprovable to one side. What Turing does is prove that in fact there is no way of telling which will be the unprovable problems. So how do you know when to stop? You'll never know whether the problem you're working on is simply extraordinarily difficult or if it's fundamentally unprovable. Everything Cantor was doing, his irrational numbers and his illogical infinities, seemed to them to be eating away at certainty. He soon faced a deep and implacable hostility. Other mathematicians actually tried to prevent Cantor publishing his papers. 
Cantor always dreamed that he'd receive an invitation to one of the great universities, but there were invitations which never came. And he was also attacked personally. His one-time friend and teacher, Kronecker, said that Cantor was a corrupter of youth. That year, he has a massive nervous breakdown. His daughter describes how his whole personality is transformed. He will rant and rave, and then fall completely and uncommunicatively silent. He tells a friend he's not sure he'll ever be able to do mathematics again. He asks the university if he can stop teaching maths and teach philosophy instead. But interesting, during this whole time, despite having claimed he'll not be able to do mathematics again, he never stops working on the continuum hypothesis. And this pattern continues. He proves that it is true, and then he's convinced that it's not true. Back and forth. And in fact, what Cantor is doing is driving himself slowly insane. When he could not solve the continuum hypothesis, Cantor came to describe the infinite as an abyss, a chasm perhaps, between, between what he had seen and what he knew must be there, but could never reach. He was just recovering from this breakdown when his son Rudolf died suddenly, four days short of his 13th birthday. Cantor wrote to a friend saying how his son had had a great musical talent, just as he had had when he was a boy. But he had set music aside in order to go into mathematics. And now with the death of his son, he felt that his own dream of musical performance had died with him. Cantor went on to say that he could no longer even remember why he himself had left music in order to go into maths. Cantor had hoped that at its deepest level, mathematics would rest on certainties, which for him were the mind of God. But instead he had uncovered uncertainties, which Turing and Gödel then proved would never go away. They were an inescapable part of the very foundations of maths and logic. If he allow certainties slipping away, and so, as then, we still desperately want to cling to a belief in certainty that makes us feel safe. Are we grown up enough to live with uncertainties 